sex offenders who do time at some point are released. When that happens, usually they'll be placed on some sex offender registry. The U.S. may be the only country with sex offender registries that also allows the general public to see who's on it, what they did, and where they live. Today we'll ask this question. Do these sex offender registries protect the public? Do they serve a useful purpose? Or perhaps do they needlessly harass and further punish those who've paid their price to society? I'm Dick Goldberg and welcome to Insights. With me on the phone is Dr. Wesley G. Jennings. He's a criminologist an associate professor at the University of South Florida. He has over 175 publications to his credit and he was recently recognized as the number one criminologist in the world in relation to his peer-reviewed scholarly publications. He has special interest in this subject today. Dr. Jennings, thanks very much for joining us. Thank so, you. You bet. So, Dr. Jennings, uh, are sex offender registries in all 50 states and the federal government as well? Yes, these uh, registries do exist at the federal level and across all states because the, the, the origin was the federal government which enacted the first registry and then they mandated that all the states follow suit in the mid to late 90s. Oh, so that it was a, I didn't realize it was a federal order that states have to have uh, sex offender registries. Um, how many people are on these registries? Across the country, there have been estimates as high as uh, in the five to 600,000 um, estimates of sex offenders in the community. As far as on the registry, it varies obviously by state and by jurisdictions within states, but in the sense that some, some counties or cities can have as many as several hundred sex offenders, where others have as, you could have as few as uh, five or 10 in more rural areas. Now, am I wrong? My, my conception was everyone who's labeled a sex offender, if they come out of prison, gets put on a sex offender registry somewhere. That, that is the, that is the requirement in the sense that yes, if someone is convicted of a sex offense, they are they are required to be on the registry. And there's variations in the requirements for what kind of information goes on the registry and what's publicly available across states and for certain types of sex offenders. But in general, yes, if you're convicted of a sex offense, po post-conviction, you're required to go on the registry. And for how long? Uh, the, that, that varies as well, but in but usually uh, most registries are have 10-year, 20-year, and life lifetime registration. Wow. And if you want to know who's on this, how easy is it for... John Doe public to look up who's on the sex registry in my town. Oh, it's it's, it's extremely easy to find this information. Um, some some jurisdictions actually publish this in a newspaper, in the sense that that goes out to the community residents. But as far as online, anyone can go online, can search the federal registry, or can search within their state, or even can go to their local. Uh, jurisdictions, police departments, websites also house these local level sex offender registry and, they, and there's also now the availability uh, for a lot of apps for phones or um, tablets where they can enter in their zip code and it will populate these sex offenders that reside within a certain specified distance from where so, they live. So in this age of computers and everyone having access to it, it's pretty easy to find out this information. Absolutely. Okay, and what information are we going to see about each offender? Generally, you'll, you'll see the obviously the name of the sex offender, their current address um, as far as where they reside, and then you'll usually see the na the type of offense they've committed. Uh, beyond beyond that, registries vary, but a lot of times they'll they'll have um, the gender, the biological sex of the victim whether it's a male or a female, or male and female victims, or they have multiple victims. They'll describe, they'll describe the criminal code or the statute that they are actually convicted and registered for. And other, the other information that can include can be even motor vehicle information, such as the year, make, and model, um, and even license plate number of the sex offenders. And there's also information as far as employment, oftentimes listed on the registry. Can you give us a breakdown of who's on there? I mean, what are the crimes that people are on there for? What sex offenses? 
Um, sex offenders, sex offenders, there's a variety of types that range from child molestation to rape, statutory rape, such as those that have um, consensual sex with one, one being a minor and one being an adult. There's also child pornography, exhibitionism, voyeurism. So there's a host of types of sex offenses, and there are a variety of, once again, of, of all those types represented on the registry. Okay. Now, I can sure understand if someone is a pedophile and they've had serial incidents of molestation with children, no one would argue about their presence on a sex offender registry, would they? No one would say they shouldn't be? Correct. For, yeah, for, the, for the most part, the idea is that if the registry exists, which it obviously does, it should exist for a purpose in a sense, for, for identifying those that present a serious risk, particularly for, say, child molestation. Pedophiles are those individuals that are a type of sex offenders that are um, that actually have a deviant and persistent attraction and clinically diagnosed to individuals younger than the age, uh, younger than the age of 11. So those that have this actual clinical diagnosis of being a pedophile are different in a sense from those you, who... You know, if I may hear, uh, Dr. We did a podcast on pedophiles, and I think we have to be careful to not put anyone who's attracted to children as belonging on a sex offender registry as opposed to people who are attracted and do something about it. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, yes, yeah, so someone has to certainly act on the, on the impulse and have committed the offense in order for, for them to get, get to the level of being on the registry. Okay. So you have no qualms with the idea of someone who's done their time for that to be on the sex registry maybe for their life. For the rest of their I life. As far as a lifetime registry, and then let, per, perhaps in the situation if they have multiple victims and have recidivated for the same kind of offense multiple times, mm -hmm. the, the the registry does include a lot of quote first time uh, or one and done let's say sex offenders. I mean the idea is that sex recidivism, recidivism in general, but sex recidivism as well, if it occurs, it generally occurs frequently post offense. Um, so the idea is that if someone's on a registry for 10 years, or even, or certainly 20 years, and have have not committed another offense mm -hmm. of any type, but obviously of the same type being a, a, another sex offense, and there's relatively um, high degree of potential uh, predictability that they're not going to commit the offense again. Okay, so if they're out of prison, so, or someone individual, sorry, go ahead. go ahead, you go ahead. Yeah, so, so for an individual who's con convicted of a commits a sex offense is charged, arrested, prosecuted, and convicted, released, registered, commits another sex offense within a year post-release, goes back to prison, um, and then then comes out, those individuals do demonstrate a, a very high risk mm -hmm. um, in terms and, and belong in the registry because they have already demonstrated that they have recidivated for the same type of offense and therefore pose even higher risk for mm -hmm. recidivating for an offense the third or fourth or subsequent time. Right. So let's say you have um, the most severe, I assume the most concern is with uh, pedophiles um, because, uh, as we learn in another podcast, if, you, if that's your predilection, it will be for life. It's not changeable. You will be attracted to children your whole life. Um, so if someone had, had done this, come out, r repeated uh, child molestation, then you feel they should be on for their, for their life after their next release. Yeah, they, they certainly be under should be under supervision of the, the well either either the government in the sense of registry and in the idea of also of treatment hopefully the idea because there is there has been some implications that and some research that suggested that uh, cognitive behavioral therapy can be an effective method for mm -hmm. for treating and managing sex offenders in the community. But the idea that them being freely to roam in the sense as they may without any kind of uh, tracking. It would, would not be something that I, that I would uh, support in the sense for those who are okay. multiple-time recidivists for the same types of child molestation offenses. What percentage of these people who are on sex offender registries right now uh, are pedophiles? Any idea? Uh, the estimates vary. I, I would probably say 5 to, 5 to 10 percent. So, okay, it's a smaller number. What is, in the top of the bell curve, what's the biggest group that's on sex offender registries? What's the offense? 
the the largest variety are likely those that commit the lower level sex offenses in the sense of, of being child pornography, um, voyeurism, exhibitionism, or is also those of rape and the varying definitions of rape as opposed to you know uh, rape versus statutory rape. Okay. So there's, I mean, there's definitely a garden variety of sex offenses across the board as far as it's really difficult to pinpoint the most prevalent sex offense per se. What I hope to accomplish is to go over these different uh, offenses and think, is this serving the public and all these offenses who should and shouldn't be, if anybody, on these uh, registries, uh, and are they protecting the public? So why don't we begin with that question about protection. Are, you think, sex registries being effective at protecting the public? As far as the the registries themselves, they're they're created under the assumptions that there is going to be obviously an element of deterrence in the sense that so should a sex offender who is registered and released released and registered on the sex offense obviously knows they're on the registry and therefore they would be less inclined to commit an offense because they know they're under surveillance. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the same idea, so that's specific deterrence. There's also the assumption of general deterrence because a would-be sex offender who has not committed a sex offense yet is aware that there's a registry. They're going to be dissuaded from committing a sex offense because they don't want to become a mm-hmm. registered sex offender. Right. So those are the prevailing assumptions, the specific deterrence for, the, for the, those who've already committed sex offenses and the general deterrence for the would-be um, sex offenders. Okay. So that in and of itself as a policy uh, makes, makes sense. But essentially, most of the research has examined these policies across various states and across various types of sex offenders, and have by and large demonstrated that there is there is no difference in the recidivism rates of sex offenders released prior to the implementation of these policies compared to sex offenders released post implementation of these policies. So, in a sense, it's a wash at at best as far as affecting deterrence. But the, so beyond that. The registries themselves have obviously increased the visibility of these sex offenders in the community to the general public, which could serve a purpose in the sense that, one, the negative aspect, promoting moral panic or a fear among residents that once they type in their zip code and realize 20 sex offenders live within five square blocks of their, you know, mm-hmm. of their house, that could certainly generate fear. But that fear needs to be tempered by if if the registries do present the type of offense and the nature of the offense and the type of victim and provide all that information, then individuals can hopefully use that information to really kind of self-evaluate their own potential risk. So for if, if sex offender A lives down the block and they committed an offense against a three-year-old child who's a female and I'm someone who, say, has no kids, then I don't consider myself at risk from, from, for that person. And certainly I don't have any children, so therefore my children aren't at risk for that person. So in that situation, I wouldn't likely have to change any of my daily activities to reduce my risk because I'm likely not at risk for that specific type of offender. So would you suggest to people if they're about to buy a house, you better check the registry to see if there's an offender near your house you're going to buy? Because you can... I have friends who are realtors, and they say, you know, this has killed a lot of sales for me. I'm about to go to the closing, and they can call it off when they find there's a sex offender within three blocks of their house. Well, I, I yeah, I, I can definitely see that implication. I've heard about, I've heard that echoed um, elsewhere as well. The the one concern in in promoting that policy, as far as you know, having individuals looking in terms of purchasing real estate to to search the area, is that these registries have been demonstrated to be oftentimes outdated information so mm-hmm. because once again the sex offenders the onus is on the sex offenders to update their information with local law enforcement so certainly sex offenders are by and large don't want to be on the registry they don't want to have their information there but they're required by law so for instance if they move they're a transient population as well so mm-hmm. if they move they're not going to suit the day they move necessarily run down to local law enforcement and say here's my new address the, the, maybe by themselves at least a few days or a few weeks um, mm-hmm. to, to have a new address so, so it, before they have to report or the, or the probation officer or parole officer contacts them and updates their information. Can't they get then, parole revoked uh, if they don't report? 
if they move into right. Over no, there. but there's a restriction right there. There's definitely a restriction. But the point of it is, as far as the immediacy of mm -hmm. the updating the information, um, even, even with those sanctions. No, oftentimes sex offenders do return to prison because violating the restrictions of their probation or parole related to the registry. Because there's there's mm -hmm. there's restrictions of the registry that are mandated. There's also restrictions of their parole and probation. So it's not always reliable, but uh, I would think people also would often make bad judgments when they uh, see there's three or four or five sex offenders near them without getting the next bit of information you talked about. Right, exactly, and and, and that's and that's a fault of of the registries that varies by jurisdiction. Some jurisdictions do present all of that detailed information that's very informative. Uh, mm -hmm. for, for citizens and some registries just provide a generic several, you know, one, two, three, here's a picture, here's their name, here's their address, and that's yeah. really it. Yeah. And so therefore it's not too useful. I mean, what would you do? Well, let, let's say you've got a kid and you're about to buy a house and you see within uh, three blocks there's two sex offenders, but you don't know, have any idea what they did. Would you buy a house? For me, that wouldn't have that wouldn't have too, too much of an effect on, on where, I, where I would purchase real estate. Why not? Looking Why not? at that Specifically, because for, well, for me, I mean, <laughs> it's like it's personal versus an implication as far as research. And well, but the you, I, that, you're the expert, and if you have a two kids, let's say you've got a two-year-old and a five-year-old, why wouldn't that influence you? Because I know the sex recidivism rates are generally low for all types of sex offenders, and uh. in, in the sense that I, I don't, yeah, the, it, they're much more likely to commit another offense relative to a sex offense. So a different the idea, type of offense. Yeah, the, the, Right. The, the odds of my house being burglarized by a sex offender are likely greater than the odds of my, oh. of my child being sexually assaulted by a sex offender. So people are overblowing this uh, threat? To a large degree, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned, and, and really one of the reasons I want to do this interview is, is some of the unnecessary and painful things created by sex offender registries, if, if you feel they exist. I mean, you mentioned some people on them who are, are guilty of statutory rape. It could be a, an 18-year-old who had sex with a 16-year-old girlfriend, right? Could get on a sex offender right. registry? Is that yes, right? Yes, they're, they're, yes, absolutely. Those are, those are a number of cases that exist in the registry where, in a sense, it, is an, it could be an 18-year-old uh, male with a 15-year-old female and they have consensual sex, but because the female is a minor, and the pres and the parents can find out, report it to law enforcement, press charges, and even if the parents want to drop the charges later, the you know the state can still pursue those charges, and then that person can, in, in a result, be convicted of a statutory rape and be required to register. And for ten years, or for life, or for how long? It varies. Well, yeah, it could be. It could, it could either be ten, twenty, or life, depending yeah. on the jurisdiction. So here, here's some guy who has sex with his 15 uh, year old girlfriend, and he's 18. For the rest of his life, he could be labeled sex offender on a registry, and everyone. What happens to him if he goes and applies for a job with that on his record? Yes, that's that's a larger implication too. Is that and if if you're a sex offender released, oftentimes you're released on parole or on probation as mm -hmm. well. And one of the main requirements of probation and parole is to have shelter and hold a job. So the idea that in some states they even require sex offenders to have a driver's license where it says sex offender on the driver's license. So you can imagine them going into a, to a, to a place of employment, filling out an application. They have to provide their Social Security card and their driver's license for documentation. The person sees sex offender written on, written on their driver's license, and that could immediately, you know, tell, you know, lead, lead the employer to to not consider their application. Well, you, you're the expert on this, but I have one bit of experience where I mentored someone coming out of prison who was a sex offender who, at 22, was high and had consensual sex with a 14-year-old, along with it was like a party. Sex offender for life now, and at 47, he couldn't get a job when he came out of prison. And I finally arranged and persuaded a manager of a Panera chain to hire him as a line worker. And he was all ready to go when Panera said, our national policy is we do not hire sex offenders. So he then tried to get a job delivering pizza in his own car and delivering sandwiches. No one would hire him saying we don't hire sex offenders. Does that fit with your experience or did I, does this guy have an extreme experience of... No, I mean, it, generally speaking, I, I do think the the yeah the employment opportunities are very bleak for for all sex offenders, regardless of the type. Is um, there and on, also the yeah. Is there in the ahead. registry? 
because when, yes, if they're on the registry, correct, when they're on the registry, because on top of that, the registry restrictions, depending on the jurisdiction, says they can't live or work within 2,500 square feet or, or is, mo is more strict as 1,000 feet of a school, park, or daycare. So there's very few employment opportunities that aren't within that same vicinity of those areas wow. as well. Is this true for any sex offender or just pedophiles? Yeah, any sex offender, as far as there, there, are res there are residency restrictions, yes. Does that make any sense to you? Again, depending on the nature of the offense and the number of the prior offenses, that could have an implication, such as if someone has committed multiple uh, multiple sex offenses against children, mm -hmm. then I can understand them not, you know, working in a daycare or, right. you know, living with, sure. living with living across the street from an elementary school. I can see that. Okay. But what if they their offense was a rape thirty years ago? No, in that situation, they're they're, they're extremely low risk. Uh, yeah, and, and then those those restrictions are kind of draconian in that regard. Yeah, and you said there's only five to ten percent of people who are pedophiles that are on the registry. The rest are not pedophiles. So why would you have them not be near a school if they're not pedophiles or grammar school? Right, and that's and that's the the general reality of the legislation is that it was it, it happened very fast. And occurred quickly uh, at the federal level, and in which was then mandated down and dis disseminated across the states without a lot of forethought or planning. So, in the sense, the, the registry and its restrictions are by and large universally applied, to, which treats all sex offenders as one unique and homogenous group. When, when there when there actually exists a lot of differences within sex offenders and across types of sex offenders. Wow. Well, you know, you're, you're kind of making the case that it's pretty ineffective, particularly because recidivism after, what, two or three years, if they haven't done it, they're not going to do it, right? Yeah, gen generally the, the risk for recidivism or the potential for recidivism drops precipitously yeah, after a year, 18 months, two years, and there on after. Yeah, of course you could have the Willie Horton effect that if it happens once and 12 years after, and the politician who was in office when that happened will be ruined, right? I'll say, oh, well, no, he, certainly, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's not. It's not politically, you know, expedient to to be pro sex offender. Certainly, I'm not arguing that. But yeah. the idea of, you know, of trying to, you know, long long term actuarial prediction assessment. If you have any false positives or false negatives, both of those outcomes are, are not, are, you know, are not not the best alternative you know, scenario. Yeah. Um, well, how many people do you think on the sex registries right now? I know this is a hard question to answer, but what percentage shouldn't be on them? And what percentage should be on that such registry? For, for me, based on research that I've been involved with, and I, I would consider about 25% of those on the registry are likely those that belong on the registry that can be identified as what would be considered, quote, high risk for mm -hmm. reoffense potential. Mm -hmm. So the idea, if the registry could be could be carved down to focus on that, say one out of every four that are currently on there, that that do present a, a high potential for recidivating, then the citizens could be in, in effect uh, more more informed on their risk in the sense because these these are the folks that they need to be on the lookout for per se. And then also for law enforcement as well. So these are the individuals they can keep keep tabs on more frequently, but rather than just if you're a sex offender probation officer and you have a hundred sex offenders uh -huh. on your probation jacket and you just follow up with all of them with the same frequency, you're, you you likely might be missing those that are the higher risk in, in your portfolio. Makes sense. But what about the people who are moderate risk? Low risk, I get. But what if you say, well, high risk will want to watch. The people who are somewhat high risk will let go. Isn't that going to be very unpopular? Yeah, I mean, if you, had, if you had to do a strict dichotomy in terms of, yeah, like I said, car carving off the high risk versus the moderate and lumping mm -hmm. the moderate and low risk together, I mean, generally that that wouldn't be the the policy I would advocate. But you, you could you could easily okay. shave off the lowest tier of of the risk from from the group and then differentially uh, follow or present different differential information for those that are in the more moderate to high-risk categories. Well, what I'm intuiting from what you're saying is if you took off the lowest half at risk, you're very likely not to have many incidents from that low half, but you will better protect the public 
because the halves that are now being supervised, the probation and parole officers can pay more attention and they're likely going to monitor them better. Monitor them better. So, in fact, public Correct. safety would be improved by lopping off the half that don't belong there. Is that fair? And, to say? The, and, and it would once again affect the, you know the idea of, of the moral panic or the or the perhaps unfounded fear if someone sees fifty sex offenders living in their zip code. Right. Really, maybe only twenty five of those you know are, are, are present some degree of risk. And then of those 25, it's only about 10, let's say, perhaps, that actually do present the most risk, so they can be on the look about, lookout for those specific people versus treating all 50 of those people as equally likely to victimize them. And when you think about why you'd – I assume you'd, you'd vote for a policy that took off the 50 percent that are least likely, off the list they go. Um, but generally, those who are on the list that, as you say, shouldn't be, they suffer job discrimination. What are the other things they suffer? Because they've already done their time. The, right. Yeah. So it, is, it does present a potential for double jeopardy in the sense that they've already served their time and now they're being uh, punished in the sense on uh, doubly upon release for having difficulty with employment and a series of other what's referred to in the literature as collateral consequences of sex offender registration and notification policies. And examples of these alternative um, additional collateral consequences could be difficulty in finding housing, um, difficulty in maintaining interpersonal relationships with friends and family that they why, had why would that prior, be? Why would that be? prior to going inside. Oh. Uh, but and, once they get out, prior, how, does, how does being on a sex offender registry affect their interpersonal relationships once they're out? Well, oftentimes they're ostracized by their family and friends in the sense ah. that nobody wants to, wants to be friends with someone who now has this stigma associated with them, right. or a lot of family members may take sides and and not want to, uh, you know, have the same kinship level or you know or, or support for these individuals when they're on the outside, because because of the larger stigma that society places on these offenders. Okay, are there any advocacy advocacy I can't get that word advocacy groups advocating to uh, imp change sex offender registries? Yes, there, there are a number of these that exist uh, across the country. Most of them are grassroots efforts from registered sex offenders uh, who, who, have, who have, you know, gotten together in a sense to, to, uh, promote, to promote the cause to, to affect registry change. But gee, what politician is going to take on this cause and say this is unfair and it's not working for society? Let's take half the sex offenders off registries. Is there any politician right, that, in the that, country who pushes that cause? I, I, I doubt there's one, because in the sense that, I mean, look, looking soft on crime is, is, is not a strong political statement, obviously, to make, and looking softer or as soft on sex crime is, is certainly <laughs> even, even less uh, favorable. So, it's, it, I mean, it is, there is some difficulty in affecting policy at, at this level for well, this group of offenders. As an expert and a criminologist, do you get frustrated? Doesn't it upset you to see this injustice or waste? Oh, for me, for, for, yes, it does. Absolutely, as a, as a policy, because if you, once again, policies exist to protect society and and to uh, reduce crime is, is the ultimate, you know, crime reduction strategy or crime prevention strategy. So, it, when policies are actually evaluated rigorously over time and across many different types of studies, and the accumulation of the evidence suggests one thing uh, versus the other, in the sense that maybe policy is not effective. And there's recommendations that can be made on how to to revamp the policy or tailor the policy mm -hmm. or customize the policy, and it falls on deaf ears, then that is certainly, a, you know, beyond an unfortunate scenario. Well, Dr. Jennings, I thank you very much. I think in this half hour, we sure have learned a whole lot about this subject. And I hope you'll join us on the next edition of Insights.